All right, here we have a survey of a random sample of 210 male teens and 228 female teens, ages 13 and 17, and they found 122 of the male teens and 160 of the female teens, teens brushed their teeth at least twice a day. If there is no difference in the proportions in the population of all male and female teens ages 13 to 17, brush their teeth at least twice a day. Approximately how many males and females in the sample will be expected to brush their teeth at least twice a day. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw, um, well, let's make a table. So we can see like what's going on here. So we'll have female, male, and we'll have like, we'll say twice a day over here. And we'll say not twice, and we'll have our total our total across like that. Okay, so we have 210 total males, 228 total females. That means we have 438 total teens and gen and across. So then um 122 of the male teens, so 122 breast your teeth twice a day, and 160 of the female teens teens breast your teeth at least twice a day. So that means there will be 68 here that didn't brush your teeth of the females, and there would be um, 70, 88 here. And down, this would be 2, 82. And we can go ahead and then we'll get 156 for that. Okay, so if there's no difference in the proportion of female teens and male teens that brush your teeth at least twice a day, that means you can look at the overall proportion that brush your teeth twice a day in this table and apply it to the female and male population. So, or samples or pop or um, whatever, like population, I guess they're asking. But anyways, so to find that, we would do 282 divided by 438. That would tell you that the total proportion of everyone in the sample that brushed your teeth twice a day So we're saying that, you know, it would be about 64%, about 0.6438. Now, so for this, we would just multiply it by the total females and by the total males. And though whatever values you get, those would be the ones that we would expect. That would be the amount that we would expect um, for females and males to have brushed their teeth. So we take this number, multiply it by 228. That would be about 147, we'll say. We'll do 0 0.6438 times 210. We'll get about 136, we'll say. We would expect this much, this many of each group if there was no difference in proportion of, of groups that, you know, that brush their teeth at least twice a day. So we have, that would be, the closest would be about, our answer would be C. Remember, these are approximations. I, sh yeah, I should actually round out to 135. All right, so let's move on. All right, researchers believe that an increase in lean body mass is associated with an increase in maximal oxygen uptake. So um, a scatter plot the measurements taken from 18 randomly selected college athlete, athletes displayed a strong positive linear relationship between the two variables. Let me zoom out a little bit. A significant test for the null hypothesis that the slope of the regression line is zero versus the alternative slope is greater than zero. And the, so the, the test yield, the p-value point 0.04. So remember, if we're running a significance test where we're sent, claiming that the slope of the regression line is zero, we're basically saying there's no relationship between lean body mass and maximal oxygen uptake. And if the alternative is that the slope is greater than zero, then it's saying that there's a positive relationship. So if, our, if we get a p-value of 0.04, that means that there's like a 4% chance that we would get data this strong or stronger if the null hypothesis was just true. In other words, if there was actually no relationship. So if there was actually no relationship between lean body mass and maximal oxygen intake, then the chance is 4%, we have a 4% chance that we would get data that showed a strong positive linear relationship between two variables. And usually, we have our alpha level of 0.05. So usually we would, we would reject the null hypothesis and we would basically say that we have um, statistical evidence or strong enough evidence to claim that there actually is a positive 
relationship that's strong between these two variables. So let's see which one of these would be like the closest to that. So, so the case of 0.4% of the variance, no, that's not, nope, nothing that. The p value of 0.04 indicates that 16% of the variance, nope, that's not, doesn't, doesn't account for that percentage or anything like that. So the strong, let's see, the strong positive linear relationship displayed in the scatter plot, along with the p value, is less than 0.05. So it is less than 0.05, it's 0.04. And so it indicates that, they're, that the college athletes with higher lean body mass tend to have higher maximal, maximal oxygen uptake. So it's basically saying that there is a strong positive relationship um, because the chance of this occurring is you know, less than 5%. So, so the answer is gonna be C most likely. Let's look at the other ones. Um, the, strong, the strong positive linear relationship displayed in the scatter plot along with the p-value less than 0.05 indicates that an increase in lean body mass causes. So we can't say cause all we can say is relationship. We'd have to do an experiment. This is, um, that's, 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 that's a whole not separate um, thing. So um, this, it's not gonna be D. And E, a p-value less than 0.05 indicates that the relationship between the scatter plot is likely to the chance and that there's no statistical, well, there is statistical evidence. The whole, the whole, the whole point here. So C is still our answer. All right, an environmental group wants to estimate the proportion of fresh produce identified as organic in a local grocery store. In the winter, the group obtained a random sample of sales from the store and used the data to construct a 95% D interval for a proportion, and got 0.087 to 0.133. Six months later, the group obtained a second random sample of sales from the store. The second random sample is the same size as the first, and the proportion of sales identified as, orga as, identified as organic was 0.4. How does the 95% Z interval for the second proportion compare with the one that was made from the previous data? So the one made in, in the winter. Okay, so let's, let's break this one down. Or let's just go over like how a Z interval works when estimating population proportions. So we start with our point estimate, which is gonna be our P hat, our sample statistic. And we're gonna do plus or minus our Z star a critical value times our standard deviation of the data. So P hat times one minus P hat over N. So for this, we would find the center or the P hat value by finding the middle of this interval. So we can add those and divide by 2.0. 87 plus 0.133 divided by two. So the original P hat value was 0.11 plus 0.11. Maybe we'll just call this uh, P winter PW hat is 0.11. So we would go 0.11 plus minus. They're both 95% confidence intervals. So the Z star value stays the same. So that's because that's our critical number. We would find that we can do our inverse norm equation or function two and a half percent to the left. And you've probably done it so much you probably have it memorized. Or, so in, in both cases, it's point it's one point nine six. Now, now for this for the second sample. So let's let's go from here. Well, let's actually, let me finish this part. So if we're doing the, if we're working with the first sample, what we would do for the, what we would get here is that 0.11 times the 0.89 divided by N. We don't know the sample size N, but we would get this for the first sample. Now the second sample, we would go and start at 0.4 plus minus 1.96 times the square root of 0.4 times one minus 0.4 the so 0.4 times 0.6 over n. Whoops. So this is for this is the winter sample. This is the one, or this is the winter sample. The first one. This is the second one. So we know first that the that the second interval has a higher point estimate. 0.4 is more than 0.11. So let's look. So we know it's not going to be a because that's a lesser point estimate. Not going to be c. So it's B, D, or E. 
So let's look at how the intervals compare. So even though we don't know the sample size n, we don't need to. We just have to understand that the, this is we want this is going to be a bigger number when the square root of the and the square root value is a bigger number. So we want to see which of these gives you the bigger square root value. So we just want to see which numerator is bigger. So we can do 0.11 times 0.89. You get 0 0.0979 for this. This one you would do 0.4 times 0.6, and you would get 0.24. So this confidence interval is going to be much wider, or not more, well, it depends on what you mean much wider, but it's going to be wider because this standard deviation value is going to be bigger. So we're multiplying 1.96 by a bigger number. We don't need to, we don't know, we don't know the exact number, but we know since the top is bigger than the top of this fraction, it's going to be wider. So then our answer would be the B. All right, in a standard golf tournament, golfers play 18 holes of golf on each of the four consecutive days. For each hole, golfers keep track of the number of times they hit the ball, strokes before the ball goes into the cup. The golfer's score for the tournament is the total number of strokes needed to complete the tournament. The box plots below summarize the scores for golfers who, completed in who competed in tournament one and golfers who competed in tournament two. So one, two. So it's, which of these statements are true based on these box plots? So more golfers play in tournament one than tournament two. Um, well, it doesn't tell you like how many were in each tournament. And let's not make the mistake of thinking that, that the bigger box plot means that there are more people. Remember, a box plot tells you what proportion or what percent of the values lie between what intervals. So remember, this is 25%, the first quartile, second quartile, third, fourth. And this one would be like just like that. So it only tells you like proportions or you can or percent of the total. So we don't know this for sure. Um, and both tournaments, at least half the golfers complete the tournament with a score less than 80, 288. So remember, half the halfway point in um, in a box plot is basically the median value. So the median value will be here. So is that less than 288? And it is because 288 is here. Look at that. So we already have the answer. It looks both these are less than this. Our answer would be B. That's pretty certain. So you know, we won't have to look at the other ones. We're in 30. Based on records kept at a gas station, the distribution of gallons of gas purchased by customers is skewed to the right with mean 10 gallons, standard deviation 4 gallons. A random sample of 64 customer receipts was selected and the sample mean number of gallons was recorded. Suppose the process of selecting a random sample of 64 receipts and recording the sample mean number of gallons is repeated for a total of 100 samples. Which is the following the best description of a dot plot created from 100 sample means? Um, okay. So this is interesting. So, so here, like, you know, they're trying to throw you off because they're saying um, the distribution of gallons of gas is skewed to the right. So they're saying, you know, it's something like this, maybe. There's a, there's a tail that's going off. It's not very good. The tail is veering off to the right. That was a mean of 10, standard deviation of 4. But since we're talking about means, or the calculating sample means, we, since our sample size is, or we're taking at least 100 or 30 samples, we're taking 100 samples, and is 100, which is greater than 30. By the central limit theorem, so the CLT theorem, tells you that the distribution is going to eventually, or is going to approach normal. It's going to be a normal distribution. So it's not going to be skewed to the right. So we know it's not going to be A or B or C. It's going to be either D or E. Remember, this is a central limit theorem. It's a big deal in stats. So make sure you look it over. So let's look, let's look at what's going on with D or E. So we just have to now figure out what the mean and standard deviation values would be. So um, yeah, the means would stay the same. Standard deviation value gets affected by um, 
the sample gets a function of sample size. So you can use your formula sheet to, you know, have, you know, a reference. You don't have to have these memorized, but you know where to look. So we're talking about talking about um, means. So we're looking for sample and distribution for means. So let's see the sampling, the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar is equal to the mean of the population. So that's why it's still that's why it, the mean is still 10. Now the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of X bar will be equal to the standard deviation of the population, which here is um what did we get? It was four. But we have to divide it by the or sorry, or the by square root of the sample. So we took a we took a hundred samples, so the square root of a hundred. So we're basically doing four divided by ten. So point four. Oops, point four. And then so our answer would be B E. It's not E. So it's not Oh, I said my this is this is let this be a lesson to me. I was I overlooked this. The sample is there's 64 in the sample. We I should actually have made the sample size 64. That was my mistake. It's still bigger than 30, but let's correct that. So for this formula, we would go four divided by the square root of 64. So four divided by eight. And so then it'll be 0 0.5. That's a close one. Yeah, so then it would be um it would be D D.